big deal sort of turnaround uh, in a matter of a few months. So very interesting to observe that at about five and a half. Another school, uh, this is much smaller. Uh, we started this a few months ago. And then this is a teacher training college that we've been working with. So we basically have four schools as pilot schools and one teacher training college where we talk to the teachers about pedagogy and what they have. Mostly their challenges in the classroom. You know, the, the institution gives you a job and you have your constraints. First, tell us what those constraints are. And now within those constraints, let's figure out how we can do our stuff. So that your job is not threatened and you feel like you're actually doing something useful. Otherwise, in most cases, teachers say, this is an extra activity and I will not do it. Right? So you have to figure out it has to be part of what they do every day, not an extra add-on. So working with these guys will do great. Uh, the second project I have is in India, the one I was telling you in the village. That's the tiny, tiny village right there. It's about 55 houses. Um, and in fact, if you click there, it'll take you to exactly where the village is. Uh, this is fairly rural and remote. Uh, this picture was in 2008. This is when I uh, was able to use these laptops to get online through my phone using a GPRS connection and send the first email out ever. And I was chatting with somebody in San Francisco. But there was no electricity, because that's usually the case. So I had to go up to the roof, mm -hmm. use a kerosene lantern, and the light of the lantern, you know, to see. Because I couldn't get a signal all the way down, so I had to go all the way to the top. Uh, lots of challenges. Electricity, no guarantee when it works. Internet access, no guarantee. Uh, school system, there are 1,100 children, uh, but the classrooms are just too small, so they all sit outside under a tree. Right? Now, on the one hand, of course, you would read them in the news and say, oh, India, you know, technological powerhouse, you've got all these big companies like Wipro and Tata and whoever, and they come and they do, you know, all kinds of work, and uh, software engineering and this and that. In that same country, you've got a situation like this because the gap is tremendous, right? And the focus is on skills, which is a skill that can get you a job, as opposed to a skill that will help you think and understand things better. So even if you, like when I brought this into the village, they said, oh, does it have Microsoft Office because I want to learn that and get a job? I'm like, no, well then we don't have any interest in it. Okay. So it's very difficult to explain that this is not about a skill, this is about getting these things moving, you know, turning the wheels up here. So it, it takes a lot of pushing every few months to make sure that they keep doing what they do. So like I said, it's, it's, it's a fairly rural, uh, not much by way of resources. Some pictures there. Um, and then we have TED. So we were able to do an offline server using one of these. This is a Fit PC2. If you haven't seen one, I'll pass this around. Um, Could you pass around the um, laptop? Yeah, box? sure. I actually have two, so I'll pass this one. So these that I have here actually do touch. They have touch screens. These are the newer laptops that do touch. Uh, that little box there, the Fit PC there, is something we were using. It has a 64 gig solid state drive. So if you were able to cram all the 1,368 TED videos on there and make them available locally. So there's a Wi-Fi thing, there's a server, it runs on batteries and solar, and the kids can get to it from the laptop. And there is a, so if anybody's interested, you know, we can talk on the email list. Uh, there's a program that allows you to grab all these MPEG-4 videos from TED, you know, uh, quietly, instead of going to the browser. And then there is a whole method to actually transport these over to AUG so that we could run them on this machine. So these are all AUG videos. Uh, every TED talk uh, that we could get our hands on and put it on the server. The children love it because, you know, it's in English, so it's a little difficult for them to catch up, but they're, they're sort of trying. But they call it their personal TV because they can go in there and watch it anytime they want. <laughs> on demand television in a place with no electricity, right? So it's running on solar and battery and all of that stuff. And I've seen a lot of them, what they'll do is um, <coughs> they'll park it like this. And watch it. Put it there like that. 
Does ever watch the videos? Um, <coughs> it gives them a sense of sort of ownership, like this is mine and this is my space, and I'm able to do things and I, you know, touch things and it, it works. And that, that's tremendous to see. Uh, that transformation. Artist. Do you bundle um, Wikipedia? Yes, so we have uh, English and Hindi Wikipedia online. Oh. We have TED. Um, and then we've got about 150 books and about, about 10 gigs of music on there, which is the first batch of offline stuff. So internet or no internet, they still have their little repository. And uh, the server typically runs the whole day. And then around 10 PM, it sort of goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning around 6. Uh, so it's able to sort of conserve power in that duration there. And then we have a, it's a strange collection of things, but there is a battery bank, there are some solar panels, there's a diesel generator, there is the grid, and depending on which whichever kicks in, there's a little toggle switch that you have to throw, and it charges, right? So, so we, we're able to get power. But, um, you know, the, the other interesting thing I found was, I went to one of those, uh, you know, Ubuntu had, used to have these UDS events, Ubuntu Developer Summit, and those were face to face. There was one in Oakland, and I went there, and there was some some guy talking about ARM servers, low power ARM servers, and they had a server about this big, and they said something like it's got 128 ARM processors in there, uh, four cores per processor, or some massive machine pulls only 300 watts. And I was like, how about just one ARM processor server? that pulls about two watts. And it took me about 30 minutes to explain to this person why I was interested in that, because he said, who in the world would want a two watt server? <laughs> everybody wants to go this way. Because that's what our industry does, right? Data center, everybody wants to go this way. And I was like, I want to run this thing on batteries. Why would you want to do that? And it took a long time for him to understand that there is another world out there, right? That can't fit in his, you know, uh, reference. Um, and if you look at the numbers, 35% uh, of the world is on the internet. So the rest of them are not. Right? Uh, and for good reason. You can't get electricity <coughs> reliably. You can't get internet access reliably. So a few months ago, we actually turned on the internet for them by plugging it in here. So there's a 2G dongle that gets plugged in here, which then gives access to the whole village. They all sort of go through it. Then we've got Squid for caching. We use Dance Guardian for filtering keywords. Because you know, parents of children are like, we don't want them to be watching any and everything out there. So we have a, a list there for that. Um, we have all the content and a few other things. So I'll share those with you in a bit. So that's again the India project. Uh, they all get uh, <coughs> 26 laptops up there in the village right now. The other thing I found in India, this is specific to India at least in my context, is that uh, these children belong to different castes. And to convince people in my family and some other people in the village that <coughs> every child should be able to get one was a big, big challenge. Because the thinking was, only the upper caste gets it, then we'll worry about the rest, or maybe not. And we're like, no, every child needs to get the opportunity. Well, they don't know what to do with it. They're not educated. They'll break it, they'll steal it, they'll sell it. No, 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 you have to give it to everybody. So it took a long time, but now it's working. <coughs> and once it works, it works beautifully. So there are lots of social barriers there. Is, is it changing their idea about their social values, or...? I think what will happen is that these people will have a very different mindset. So I don't think it'll... Generate. Yeah, I don't think it'll make much of a difference to their parents. Because they're just, you know, I mean, 40 years or something is very hard to change. Right? Um, all right, so <coughs> state of the hardware, where we are with hardware. Uh, this is a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek type slide. There are four versions of the XO, and they all look the same. Right? So it's very hard to actually tell which is which. The one you have that's going around is the XO4, the very latest one. It's an ARM processor from Marvell, uh, 1 gigahertz, multiple cores. I say multiple cores because I don't know how many cores. Uh, Marvell tells OPC that has got and what, two cores or three cores? And then when we look, we find out that it's got more than three, but they won't tell us, you know, because of negotiations and all that stuff. So it's one of those mystery processors that has multiple <coughs> cores, but they only tell us it's got two or three. 
So like only a certain number are enabled? Yeah. <coughs> so one of those four idea tricks, I guess. Wait. Um, <laughs> They only have one design in the background. Like, so like, yeah, something like, I don't know, but anyway, so it's multiple, but you know, in most of these places, because of power consumption and all that, everything sort of just runs on a single core. Uh, so the XO1 was x86, AOEGO, 433 megahertz, that's the original one that most people have seen. There's a 1.5 that was also x86, but 1 gigahertz VO processor that most people have not seen. Uh, <coughs> definitely works better than this guy. And then the 175 came out, ARM, this was when we switched to ARM, with a single core. Um, and from what I remember, the biggest problem was 3D acceleration for video. Because that's the space where it all gets proprietary and nobody tells you how and all of that stuff. So it was very, very ugly. And it's been solved to quite an extent. And the XO4 is what you have. And this is the one that does touch uh, in that, if you look closely, I'll pass the other one around. Inside here, you'll see a black bezel, and that bezel has LEDs, and it creates a light grid. So the touch is not in the screen. There's a light grid, and when you touch somewhere, it breaks the light and figures out where it is. It's like old style ATMs. Probably. Right. So this overlay costs like two or three dollars to produce. <coughs> and then this screen is the same from 2007. So nothing has changed there. So that was sort of Do you way. want to talk about this? Because I don't know if everyone oh. knows about the... So the screen was yeah. developed, um, the, the, the very first CTO, <coughs> excuse me, Mary Lou Jepson, developed the screen in a way where it's a low power consumption screen because that's usually where all your battery goes. You know, check any phone and you'll see on the Android thing, the battery, you know, uh, this much consumption is by the screen and everything else is tiny. So the deal here was, one, it should be low power. Two, you should be able to go out in the sun, and this should be readable. So this becomes fully sunlight readable, reflective, outside. In fact, it will drop to a black and white screen. So it's almost like e-ink, right? Sort of like e-ink, but it's, it's still got the full refresh and all that. Yeah. Um, the video, so there's a, there's a display controller chip, Decon, which actually holds the pixel buffer and every five seconds or something, the machine will actually suspend and go to sleep with the screen turned off. And that's because you could be here reading while the machine is asleep, and then when you move, it wakes up, does the next thing, goes back to sleep. So extend the battery life, but the screen says stays on. You go outside, there is a tiny LED which detects ambient light and throws the screen from becoming you know, backlit to you can actually turn the backlight off all the way to zero, and then that's what you get out of it. But it's fully readable in some way. So lots of things went into the development of the screen. And they can adjust well, it. Can I get the black one? Oh. So who did the development of the screen? So all this was done by OLBC. And then what they did was, after the first run was done, uh, Mary Lou Jepson, who ran all of that stuff, she spun off from OLBC and created a company called Pixel G. And then they now produce these screens for any and everybody. So there are all these sort of white label Android tablets out there that use their screen and cell phones and so on and so forth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so screen is special. But anyway, like I was saying, they're all the same in terms of the way they look. The, the only differentiating factor is on the hint, you'll see a series of raised dots which sort of tell us which model this is. <laughs> and that's again in code, I guess, because it's not like, oh, four dots means four, because obviously it's not one, two, three, and four. Um, but there were lots of reasons why they wanted to keep it the same. Uh, so the latest generation is this, touchscreen, Wi-Fi, and camera microphone sensors. Uh, and then they added an HDMI, HDMI, <laughs> micro HDMI, yes, out. So you can plug it into a, a, a monitor and be able to. So I've actually plugged these into, you know the smart boards where you can point on the screen with a big projector in the back? And it works. In fact, no drivers required. You just plug it in and it just works out of the box. You just go point, point, draw. And it works. Um, and of course, <coughs> if you haven't handled like so before, it's robust, built for a kid. So. Uh, Try doing that with an iPad. <laughs> right. There is still alive. Um, 
Um, okay. The software side is interesting. It started off with OPC. There was a lot of development internally. At some point, there was this story, and this is sort of the, the thing that a lot of people remember, uh, that OPC decided to go Windows. Anybody remember that? Let's see. So, so there were conversations about that, that there should be a version of Windows because it seems Microsoft was interested in that. And so they said, well, the way this will happen is the machines will always be Linux. But you could put an SD card in there, there's a slot here, which would have a copy of XP and choose to boot it to Windows. <laughs> and the version of XP was a special version of XP called XP-UP. UP stands for unlimited potential, which really means it's for the third world where you'll have to pay a $7 license for it. So for $10 extra, $3 for the SD card, $7 for the license, you would get Windows XP UP that you would put in the SD slot and your project would get Windows. And they actually even had somebody from Microsoft work on it and show that they could actually boot into XP and all that stuff. It never happened. Not a single machine got shipped ever with Windows. Not one, right? And so there was, anytime there's this discussion, there's one on Slashdot, and finally the VP of hardware came out and said, I approved every single SKU from the factory. I am telling you, not a single machine ever shipped with Windows. So there was never a Windows XP, you know, uh, laptop from OPC ever. Now, if somebody had decided to do that, the idea was that it would come with the SD card, and then the kids could easily pop that out, and they would get the Linux and Sugar version. So from the factory, this is what ships, and then if you pull the SD card out, it will go back to what it was supposed to be. Uh, it seems the requirements came from some country, I think it was Egypt or someplace, where the RFP said that the computer should have the ability to boot into Windows. This is how RFPs are written, to sort of you know, make it favorable to one vendor. So they will say, your screen should be 9.75 inches, right? Some weird number like that. And you look at all the vendors who are bidding, and there'll be one who's so this is sort of how it's doctored. In this case, it said your computer should be able to boot into Windows, and that's why that dance happened. So anyway, I'm on camera, I'm telling you. Nothing ever shipped with Windows. Okay. So you can sleep easy tonight. Um, <laughs> all right, we all drink Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah, I know, this has been, if I had to pick any one thing, this is it. It's like, everybody. I went to Oscom, and I was walking around with this, and they're like, Oh, yeah, the thing that went Windows. I'm like, no, it did not go Windows. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sore point. So the software is called Sugar. It sort of looks like this. It's designed on um, what's called studio thinking, which is very focused. You work on one thing at a time. Uh, so everything happens full screen, kind of like what you now see with Android and so on. Everything's full screen, one at a time. Um, and very icon driven. Uh, we've had some children in the India project where they accidentally switched their language to Spanish and then they thought that they broke something so they didn't want to mess with it anymore. So for two months they used it in Spanish in a village where they don't know what Spanish means. It's the pretty, you know, yeah. and some allies. So, so anyway, so we went back and talked to the kids and they said, oh, we did something and it became Spanish and we did not know what it was. So I was like, how are you using it? Oh, it doesn't matter because you just look at the picture. And if you are confused, you look at your friend's laptop and you figure out what it says. And so for two months, they just used the icons without worrying about the, the, the text. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. Comes with all, all kinds of applications. So there's a word processor based on Abbey Word. Um, they all look different though, they look like this because the UI is very different. Um, but they're all based on sort of what we deal with pretty much every day. So this is based on Abbey Word. Uh, there's a program that allows you to search for books and you plug in any source, offline or online. So for instance, this is talking to the Internet Archive, going through their catalog and searching and then you can click on Get Book and then that book comes into your laptop instead. So you can plug it to different repositories. Yes. With, with the, I guess, the sugar eyes, say, um, Abbey Word, mm -hmm. is the, the sugar code in the main Abbey Word <coughs> code repository, or is it like fork or something? No, so, there, so, so Abbey Word part goes back and forth, and they sort of keep that uh, upstream. But there is a, there's a separate portion uh, that lives below Abbey Word, which allows for collaborative work. 
So sort of like Google Docs collaboration type stuff, but happening within Abbey Word. So you you'd be able to be here, and then you'd say, let me go there and share with you, and then you would fire up your Abbey Word, and we would collaborate across over a mesh or over the network. But that collaborative layer is based on Jabber XMPP, and that lives below Abbey Word. So that part is done by these guys, but separate from Abbey Word. But within the application, yes, it's. Well, I mean, in terms of like the UI. No, so, the, so the UI is just simply, you know, it's all GDK based, so they just swap it with whatever. Okay, so that's pretty trivial. Yeah. But the code is still, so they don't actually maintain any specific versions of any of the apps. Just take the stock and then do the UI and put it together. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so this works with, at this point, in our Internet Explorer, but you could point it, for instance, to a library here. So, we use a piece of software called Pathagar which produces a catalog using the open publication and distribution system, which is also what the archive uses. So you can actually build a offline library here and pick and choose what you want and just put them here and offline. Yeah, and that's basically like, that, that came from an Atom feed initially. It's based on, so yeah, so it's, it's basically Atom feed, and then from the Atom feed, when you click here, it's all the HTTP. Yeah. Are you working with the World Reader Project at all? You know, we've talked to them a few times, but there hasn't been any anything that's collaborative. No. It seems like they're going through some of the same things. Through right, and there are lots of projects that do this because everybody, well, part of it is there's not much chatter. And then the other is, you know, we are already invested in this. It's very hard to switch out of here and go someplace else. So, yeah. so we see a lot of, you know, repetition for sure, yes. Um, there's a book reader that allows you to do text-to-speech, so it'll actually do karaoke-style highlight and read it out to you. We found that helps children a lot in trying to uh, speak. It also does accents, not very, very well, but fairly close. It'll do, it'll do the potato, potato thing, uh, tomato, tomato thing, whatever you know. So it, it'll do that kind of thing. But some of the accents are, yeah, they're, they're not quite there. Uh, some faint stuff. So this is interesting because because this is not capacitive, right? So you can use any object to paint. So I actually took my kid's paintbrush, dry paintbrush, and I did that. And it's very interesting because you can take just a regular paintbrush and go, and it doesn't have to be that expensive $20 capacitive stylus that you have to, you know, hold on to to do the capacitive thing. Um, it's, it's fairly usable. You get the browser, to browse the web. This is based on WebKit. It used to be Mozilla, but now it's WebKit. Uh, this is a sort of a built-in oscilloscope, if you will. You can plug in anything into the microphone port and then pick up the variations here for left and right channel. You can also switch it so you can do resistance and voltage. And then you can generate tones uh, to, to tune a guitar. Uh, you can do a whole bunch of things. You can also, after you're done with all this stuff, save it and then put it into a charting activity to be able to chart the data that you just got. Is, is that anything special about the, the audio input on this, or is it something that you can do with well, the so software on any other Linux box? There is some electronics here. There are some electronics here that sort of help with, um, you know, well, one is calibration, right? So whatever goes in, do I see it calibrated properly? And then the other is to do with, you know, the voltage shouldn't be too high to kill something inside. Right? So it has some little protect some stuff to protect there, but not something that cannot be done on another, another machine. It's not that. Difficult. Uh, that to be easy puzzle, then. Right. Okay. Right, that's true. Right. So, um, so a lot of places they've used this in the curriculum, especially to, to do like lemon batteries or, or photovoltaic, you know, like or like light sensor, heat sensor, those kinds of things. Um, Can you use the audio output to, to drive anything? Like, um, like motors. I guess we could. I don't know. I'm remembering the joystick port on the Atari, and they had yeah, basically yeah. this kind of thing where you can, you right. can buy a kit, and it's basically just a bunch of plugs, and you plug in the heat sensor and the light sensor and stuff, and right. it just go through as a nice little challenger. I guess we should be able to. Um, I know one teacher, for instance, so in here there's a little magnet on the keyboard right here, which allows it to figure out that you're actually in tablet mode, which means when you touch here, the on-screen keyboard will come on. But if it's not in the tablet mode, the screen won't come on. So there's a tiny magnet here. And then there's a sensor here, right? They're very simple. So this teacher figured out there's a magnet, and so what he did was he, he put together a little you know, paper clip rotating thing, 
and clip it onto this thing and then attach it over there. When you spin it, every time it goes by the magnet, you will see this spike on the oscilloscope. So, you know, stuff to teach physics. So, so Papper's idea basically was this. Learning by doing, this kind of learning sticks. Whereas if I just told you, you know, sound is a wave, then you just take it for granted. And now they're telling us what the universe is eight dimensions or a holographic projection or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think these guys don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> We've got about half now. Okay. So there's other stuff. Uh, you can do simulation with this thing called physics. Whatever you draw, takes on gravity, falls, you can produce objects and so on. If you do other things, yeah, this is a telescope attachment. So it's actually a little... You didn't bring one? Huh? Uh, you know, I had to actually give mine away to somebody. I was in Curacao for a meeting and then I gave them mine. So. I one. But that's that's a picture of the moon, right? So focus on the moon, you can actually, you know, open it up and you can see the craters and stuff like that. Uh, we also did a video where, so my daughter said, uh, does the moon actually move? And I was like, well, it does move. And then we said, okay, let's do this. So we set this up and we hit the record thing. And then we took the, you know, pulled the video and ran, I think, like 3x or so. And you can sure enough see the moon go. And so, we did a lot of fun things with it. Uh, this is a little, Magnifier that somebody built out of a plastic acrylic lens that you put on the camera there, and that's the Eye of George, in the dollar bill, right? And it's a that acrylic thing cost like a cent and a half or something. Yeah, so the hardware store, I think they said the least we would sell you was six thousand units or something <laughs> like that. It was so cheap. These are things that you that I remember OPC having this kind of stuff years ago. And everyone's going like, look what my iPhone can do now. I was like, well, it's not. Well, but the other interesting thing is these are coming from volunteers. So this is from somebody in Fremont. He just sat there and he found these little things that they actually blew onto the door for decoration. So he got these at the hardware store and he bought a whole box of it. And then he's like, look, this is what you can do. He actually did a bottle cap, hanger wire, uh, popsicle stick, adjustment thing. So that's what that is. Oh, for You can do that and you can focus. Right? And then you put the dollar bill there, and there is the eye. Right? For, for a few cents. <coughs> yes? Um, when they're planning voltage or something like that, is there a time base that they can adjust so that you can yeah. have a, a maybe, maybe all day long or something like that? You can do um, intervals, but I don't think it's all day. You can go up to, I think, like five hours or two hours. Okay. Something right. like that. And then when you're doing the, the audio, you can do time base and frequency base. So for instance, if you do frequency based, and you will see, you know, like really low frequency here, the high ones, mm -hmm. you can see the pitch sort of go up like that. Okay. And then uh, there's a camera there, you can do a bunch of things with that. You can program Lego robots using Scratch, that works fairly well. Uh, there's an abacus, and you know, these are OPC guys, so they just can't do one kind of an abacus, right? <laughs> so there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine kinds, and then they make your own. So pick anything and, you know, just make an out of it. There's a music thing so we can compete with the iPad, right? So it looks like it's a bit, you know. Um, turtle art is very interesting. It's sort of like Scratch. Make the turtle do things. But the guys who write turtle art, what they've figured out is they can actually use turtle art to create other applications. So you can do stuff here and then go use one of these options here to say export to Python. And then that Python becomes the basis of your new application. So you can create objects in other programs using this. Uh, you can also import some of it to see the logic of what you just did using block programming. Uh, everything is stored in a journal. So it's a linear list. And then it's, it's a little difficult to deal with if you're used to files and folders. But uh, eventually you get used to it. You can search there by time and by kind of activity. The idea there is that when you click on something, it picks up where you left off. So instead of creating yet another new thing, you click on something. So if I click, let's say, on total blocks, it will create, it will not create a new instance, it will pick up where I left off. And I can continue to work. So it's like the old pump, basically, where, yeah, where right. you never, I mean, everything would quit and you switch, it wouldn't multicast. Exactly, it, but yes, yes. Everything would load up exactly where you were last. Right. And then most of these machines also ship with GNOME, and you can, I'm sure, sympathize with that side of the story, like how much of a problem that has been, which is what do we ship with, what version, you know, and so on. So, but some schools use it for the secondary school side of it, so 
is that. Um, oh, you mentioned you mentioned the high school laptop. Yeah. That, that what that's did you say that? the keyboard like this. So that's the clicky keyboard you get. And uh, as opposed to the number one. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. So there's that one. Yeah, yeah. So this is like a, a bigger yeah, keyboard. Yeah, I noticed that. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but that's the only difference, really? Yeah. And then they would they would typically be using GNOME you know, uh, with you know like LibreOffice and. Do these both have the light sensory um, touchpad here? Yes. So the country gets to pick which keyboard layout they want. They want this or they want that. Um, uh, language translation is uh, they have their own setup using Poodle. And so you've got the 110 or 113 different projects set up. Anybody can jump in and help with translation. Uh, so I would say about 30 to 35 are f fully done. The rest of them are just come and go. Interest. Now this is a, something new, so, so we just had a summit in October, this is the newer part, so I wanted to sort of bring this in as well, which is what happens beyond the Excel, beyond this laptop. So you have a kid who's got a laptop, they've got the journal on it which stores all of their work, they take it home, so that's a complete system in itself. But when they come to the school, the school has a, like a micro cloud setup, which is basically a server like this with Wi-Fi, and then all the network-based services live here. Right? So everything from DHCP to uh, DNS and Squid and all of those things live here. But this may not be connected to the outside. So your school essentially becomes your little internet in a box. Uh, but if you have connectivity, there is a third layer, which is we're just calling it cloud because different projects have it differently. But typically, this will be something that the Ministry of Education will demand. Give me a central place where I can log in and see what's happening at the schools. So it's like a dashboard. Um, so the microcloud lives at the school, and the ones that we have right now, it's uh, again a, uh, well, this one is thankfully not Fedora based uh, because it would be too difficult to update. This is CentOS 6.4 based, so it's fairly, fairly new. Uh, and it has 6. <coughs> And uh, this will do, let's see, you can do mirroring of content, you can do backup restore. So backup restore is pretty pretty amazing actually, it's seamless. Uh, it figures out automatically where you were, where you left off, uses rsync, plus a bunch of other things to figure out, bandwidth traffic, time of day, all of that stuff. And with zero intervention, your data store gets back up, back up to the server. Uh, your, the kids data, the, the data store. Okay. So what you see there as the journal is, a, is an XML data store in the back. And that gets pushed to the server. So the idea is that for some reason, if this thing goes blank or dies, or you, you reflash it, you can now go to the server and say, or sync it back. And they get all their work back. But now that the, all the work is on the server here, you can actually go through it and do some interesting analysis of what the kids do in school and at home and so on. So that's something we've been doing. Uh, so in terms of appliance, this is the Fit PC2, Fit PC1 is like that. That's a box we use in Canada. Uh, it's about four or 450 bucks. And this is the setup we have in India. We actually took one of these laptops and made it into a server. We figured why not, it's got a battery, it's got a processor, it's got a whole bunch of other things. So we made it into a server, and then all the other peripherals, that's a TP link router to talk to a 3G modem. So this is a 3G modem, that's a TP link router, some power supply stuff, and then that goes to the Wi-Fi thing. They found an old broken briefcase, put everything in. And so that's what runs the server <coughs> in the village in India. Uh, on the server, there is a learning management system. We use Moodle. So if a school wants to build all their courses, they could build everything on Moodle. And then you have Moodle running here. Uh, that's the library we use based on Pathagar. So that's the one that does uh, OPDS. And you can, it's an indexable, searchable library, search by author, and so on. It's also possible to do this. This is a project called Internet in a Box. They have a way to, they use Python Flask to create a framework. And you can offline all of these things. So Wikipedia, a whole bunch of books, video, software, um, OpenStreetMaps quite useful. You can offline all of those things into a box here. Then some of the bigger projects like um, Nicaragua, for instance, do these other things, which is they do the monitoring. So we still use the same setup. 
Uh, some of this we've built in Jamaica. So, for instance, you can go in there and say, some kid came and said, my laptop was stolen. You go and say, Mark has stolen. What that does is, it revokes the lease, and when that machine turns on, at the firmware level, before it gets to the operating system, it'll actually get locked. And it'll say, this laptop has been marked as stolen. And it will not turn back on until you bring it back, and report that it has been recovered, and it gets unchecked as stolen, and then the firmware will open up. So you have a theft deterrent system that works not only at the school, Evidently, you can also trigger this on anywhere on the internet. Uh, because the moment that thing comes on somewhere, trying to get onto the internet, the firmware basically gets locked. And so it's a way to prevent people from stealing. We use Nagios for monitoring, so you can figure out what's happening at the school with bandwidth usage up and down. Uh, we use Puppet to do provisioning. So if you want to send off a new device to a school, you would put the basic stuff on there. And then you would use Puppet to do all the provisioning, uh, to set up all the stuff, and then manage it remotely. So there are something like 80 schools in Nicaragua that are all managed using Puppet. Uh, and none of these guys actually go out to the site to do any installation. They ship a box with some basic instructions. The red wire goes here, green wire goes here, plug it and turn it on, and then all the provisioning is done using Puppet. Uh, this is something that I've been working on in Jamaica, which is the analytics side of it. So we gather all this data from each kid, all this work that's happening in the journal. We go through the journal, and we make sure that you can't go through this data and identify the kid, because that's a no-no. But there is something still that is unique enough to say that this was a unique record, but not associated with the individual. So then we take all the stuff, and we're able to generate stuff like this, which is, at a given school, what's the frequency of use? And guess what we found at the school in Jamaica? Tux math is the biggest thing. They love tux math. That's what they want to play all the time. But then we see that there is all this other stuff that's happening. Now you can take this, which is living here, and push it further up to the Ministry of Education, where they get a dashboard to see all the schools. So we've got that stuff, and this is something we are still working on. It's not completely done. And we have to deal with this problem, which is every once in a while, some school will go offline. Then how will I get the data when they come back online? So we use CouchDB. Anybody familiar with CouchDB? It's an interesting database thing where um, it uses this concept of eventual consistency, which is it can make the databases consistent even if it's six months out. So basically, whenever it connects, it will push. And so the data from a school here, will eventually get pushed here, and then because this is a database, you can do views on the database and plot those out using JavaScript and a bunch of other things to see aggregates, not like per kid, but aggregate across the school, like, you know, what time of day do they... So we've been able to pull stuff like this, like uh, frequency of use, which application is used the most, um, day of the week, most busy day of the week type thing. Now, a lot of this is mock data because we're still building this, uh, but it's, it's getting close. Uh, so that's all OPC stuff. I'll spend a few minutes on Sugar Labs. Uh, this is sort of the new growing thing. So when Sugar Labs happened, um, there was this, in some ways, this ideological split between OPC and what Sugar wanted to do, which is Sugar said, all this has to be free and open source. Good evening. May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing in 20 minutes. If you have much room to check out, please come to the account information desk now. If you would like to get a library card, please do so within the next five minutes. Thank you. Okay, I've got about five more minutes, so. Uh, so a lot of the work now is essentially done in Sugar Labs on the software side. So if you're interested in you know working, helping out, trying to figure out what, what else is happening, or to bring this into your school system, focus on Sugar Labs as opposed to hardware site. I mean, that's largely a dumb thing. So, this is this has been a sore point because, well, as you know, with anything else out there, depending on which distribution is your favorite, their, their support will be better. Right? So at this point, Fedora is the number one because that's what we use on the old PC laptop. But, having said that, we now have this available on Debian and, of course, Ubuntu Linux. 
it's meant. Uh, they all have different directions. For Ubuntu, for some reason, or a few reasons, they use something called suites. It's actually not an apt-get thing. It's a shell script that you run that does a bunch of other things. I think it adds a PPM. Anyway, it's not very pretty, but it will get you sugar on your Ubuntu desktop, just like Fedora, you know, so. so you can do all of those things and get sugar running on your machine. If you don't like any of those things, you can do VirtualBox, which will run on basically anything that runs VirtualBox. You'll get sugar running in a VM, um, which then you can run on OpenStack. How nice would that be, right, in the cloud? Um, you have sugar on a stick, which is essentially putting sugar on a USB stick. Uh, it works, but I'll tell you that uh, this whole case study on how, how the community of Fedora has dealt with this project is, is uh, a testament to how things go wrong in our projects. Um, you know, here's a problem. We know we have to solve this. A lot of people would love the solution, but you know what? We will do it the Fedora way or the Debian way or whatever, and so five years later it's still a very difficult thing to sort of deal with. It's gotten better, but it's, it could be much better. Um, and you can put sugar on Raspberry Pi. So you can do Pydora, which is Fedora on Pi, and then add sugar to it, it works quite, quite nicely. And you have sugar on tablets. This is another tricky thing. So sugar is built on GTK. So it's got the GTK dependency and the X dependency, which means it will not run on Android, because Android you cannot do stuff running on X. Or evidently you can, but it's very tricky and difficult. So you actually can't get sugar to run on an Android tablet. The problem now is that wherever you go, whichever ministry you talk to or whoever, everybody wants Android. Oh, I want Android. Android tablets, Android. So now it's like, can we put sugar on Android? No, we can't. Why? Because we decided seven years ago, we'll do X, and now those decisions have to be modified. So it's been very difficult to figure that part out. There are some solutions, but not very interesting. But we do have sugar running on an x and the way to do that is you take an X7 and you put Ubuntu desktop for ARM on it, not Ubuntu Touch. Right? There's an Ubuntu ARM version. You put that. And then you do the sugar stuff, and sugar will work on the Nexus 7. Which means anybody who has an Nexus 7 will not do it, except us, right? So my point here is that I think it should be easier than any of these things. It should not be this difficult, because if it is, people will not use it. And that's sort of been a failing of, I think, a lot of the community is not understanding that this stuff is very difficult to propagate if you don't make it easy. But I think this stuff will fly, which is sugar on the web. So this is work coming from OPC France. They basically did a replica of sugar on Chrome. This works better in Chrome than Firefox. You can actually go there and you will get a limited version of sugar running inside a browser with HTML5 and CSS. So they've actually started switching activities or applications from Python to HTML5 and JavaScript. So these are all HTML5 and JavaScript. And within these machines, they can both coexist. So you can have an application written in Python. You can have an application written in HTML5 and JavaScript, sort of like that. And the user will not know the difference. It works equally well. So we have a transition now, which is maybe we'll do Python and HTML5, or we'll do HTML5 only. But if something like this works really well, it would be great because what I saw at my kid's school with Scratch, it worked because it worked in a browser. So you'd be able to go to a school and say, hey, just go to that URL, and you have everything you need over there. No business of USB sticks, bootable, flashable, this, that, and the other. So um, I'm quite excited about this project. Anyway, so lots of uh, moving parts here. OPCMap.net is a mapping utility for volunteers and projects and community and so on. So you can always go and check out to see who is near you who's doing this kind of stuff. If you start something new, feel free to add yourself to this. Uh, this is a growing uh, map of the volunteer community. And <clears throat> the hope is that you know this thing keeps growing and kids around the world get that opportunity, which is to be able to learn and you know, definitely solve problems better than we have uh, because we're not in a very happy place right now. So, that's the project in a nutshell. Questions? Yes. So yeah. I, I've seen an, an XO tablet yes. that runs Android that like yes. works those. Can you mention what that is? So there's a reason why it's not on my slides. 
because we don't know anything about it. It comes from the company, but it is not produced by the company in a sense. The hardware is a Nexus 7 knockoff sourced by Vivitar. Uh, the software is stock Android with an add-on that was that is a proprietary project developed by one guy in New Zealand, or maybe two guys in New Zealand. Done as a quick thing just to sort of say we have something in the Android space, but with zero input from anybody in the community or even the employees for that matter, except for maybe like three people. So as a result, nobody pays attention to that. They're like, yes, it's there, yes, it's associated with the brand, but none of the stuff will run on it, no sugar, none of those things. And what they're sort of selling online is, is completely disconnected with anything that has happened. That's really confusing. Because I thought like, oh, it it's is. going in. And some of it is by design. Let me tell you that. Some of it is by design because to the person who doesn't know the distinction will say, all this stuff happened, right, with OPC. And here's the thing you can buy at Walmart. And here's the thing now you can buy this at Walmart. Well, guess what? They're not connected, right? And, well, I don't want to say too many things, but <laughs> the, way, yeah, the way we are dealing with it is not worry too much about it, just focus on what we do. Because we know that this stuff works. Uh, how long has this program been going on? How long? Yes. So officially it started 2005. But the project that led to that was in 1998. And what started the 1998 project was something that happened in 85. And every, so if you track it back, it's something like 1967 is when it first started. Is there like a life, a life cycle considered, uh, considered for the product or the user? Um, is there a point where the uh, uh, student graduates and uh, keeps the laptop after they graduate? It varies by project, but in most places, by the, 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 the life expectancy of the device is about 